This podcast is brought to you by Kiefer Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on kieferher.com. Hi, I'm Renee. And I'm Donna. Welcome to the Key For Her podcast. In this series, we aim to educate and open up honest conversations with both medical professionals and real life women. We want to shine a light on those topics that sometimes go unspoken about and help empower women to know what is key for their health and well-being. On this episode of the Key For Her podcast, Dr. Quiva Hartley talks oncology and the use of HRT with Professor Conleth Murphy. I suppose I'm interested to get a bit of background through what, um, what sort of enticed you into what you're doing at the moment. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have been working in oncology now for 21 years, actually, this year. Uh, So I did my training. I qualified in medicine in Galway, in NUI Galway. And then I did my uh, kind of my junior doctor schemes in Dublin, mainly based in James's Hospital in Dublin. And my first job as an SHO, a senior house officer, uh, junior doctor, was in oncology. And I just I worked with an amazing team. Um, I just fell in love with the specialty. Uh, I loved the fast pace and the real uh, uh, focus on evidence. The evidence in oncology kind of uh, develops all the time. Um, When I look back on my career to date, I've been working now for 20 years. The treatments we're giving now are radically different from even from when I started in in, uh, oncology 20 years ago. So it's a really exciting specialty to work in. The patients are amazing. Um, uh, We really meet such incredible people, um, the patients and their families. And uh, you really feel like you are uh, hopefully making a positive difference. And, And most most people with cancer are cured, uh, but even for the patients who aren't cured, there are positive differences that you can make um, in their treatment journey. There must be challenges, though, within oncology. I think when I was training, I remember being quite intimidated at the level of research in academia. Like it's a real it's a really like it's a specialty. You need really need your brain working to be an oncologist. There's a lot of data and information and it's so broad isn't it like you deal with lots of different parts of the body it's not just you're because you specialize in it's not just you're kind of general oncology conduct isn't it right it's not just one particular uh, well, I, I focus on kind of three major areas now, uh, I, and that's probably one of the differences that has developed over time as well, is that in, in, once upon a time, people treated all different cancers. And uh, now you get more and more what we call subspecialization. And uh, so I treat uh, breast cancer. I treat gynecologic cancers such as ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer. And then I treat genital urinary cancers like testicular cancer, bladder cancer and prostate cancer. So even, you know, that's quite a quite a number of different cancers there. And um, I think, you know, if I was trying to also keep up to speed with all the data that is emerging uh, in colon cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, lymphoma, it just wouldn't be possible anymore. The amount of data and new developments that comes every month, every year, it is sometimes a bit overwhelming, actually. Uh, so when, when we go to our big meetings, uh, often uh, when you're working as an oncologist, you say, OK, what's going to impact on, the, on my patients tomorrow? When I go back to clinic, what are the pieces of information I need to take from this meeting that is going to change treatment for the for, for X patient? And often we go to meetings with, with particular patients in mind, actually. You've got somebody that you're kind of really thinking, what, what am I going to do next for this person? What's the next step for this person? And and they're on your mind when you're at a meeting uh, and you're saying, OK, I'm going to go to this session here because that's that's relevant to patient X. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah, that's it's so interesting, isn't it? I think, you know, some patients get under your skin almost or you have challenges and you're not, you know, and they stay with you until you you go to try to seek an answer for them. I think that's interesting for patients to know that, that you have certain people in mind when you're going to certain lectures or, you know, attending things about different evidence bases. And we've obviously crossed paths a little before kind of bringing just bringing it towards the kind of breast cancer side of things specifically, because obviously, you know, my area and looking at hormone therapy in particular. And there's obviously people are well aware that there is a connection between HRT and breast cancer. And that would be the big 
challenge for a lot of women. I think they, you know, they have concerns over that. And that's where we would cross paths a little. Yes, absolutely. And I would annoy you and pick your brains about different <laughs> things to do with that. But a lot of the patients that I find most challenging are patients who have had breast cancer. And I think one of the issues, um, and I'd love to hear kind of your take on this, but a lot of the issues that I find uh, difficult are, and for patients in particular, they're bombarded with information. And because breast cancer is not one disease and because HRT isn't one medication, yeah. You know, they'll read things that maybe don't apply to them or they're they're maybe applicable to somebody with a different type of can a different type of breast cancer, even. Yes. And a lot yeah. of wading through that information as a patient must be really difficult. How do you help people figure that out? Um, I I must say that they are the group of, of women who've had a hormone positive breast cancer, and most breast cancer, about 70% of breast cancer is, is hormone responsive. So the breast cancer cells show an ability to grow in response to the female hormone estrogen in the body. Um, the women who have had a history of breast cancer, they're somewhat excluded from all the current um, discussion about HRT and and it's been very positive the the increased awareness of of hormone replacement therapy and the swing of the pendulum back a bit from the extreme way that it had gone where HRT was universally bad for a while there, um, uh, I, but I do feel that they are uh, an a, an excluded group because a lot of women come into me they've had a hormone response to breast cancer they're talking to their friends their friends have had severe menopausal symptoms and have started HRT and their lives been transformed they say yeah. my quality of life is amazing i'm able to do this this and, and this that i wasn't able to do before and they come and they say can i go on hrt um but they're um unfortunately uh, excluded from a lot of the research that has been done and um the, the kind of the short answer is that we really don't know um how uh, unsafe or safe hrt is in women who've had a breast cancer diagnosis um, if I could kind of go back a little bit to talk about um, uh, HRT in general and breast cancer risk, and then we might come back to that group of patients. Um, because, you know, when I was uh, in my training uh, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, the, the message was uh, we had just got results from uh, this large, uh, huge study called the Women's Health Initiative, which said HRT is bad. It increases the risk of breast cancer. And immediately the prescriptions of HRT just fell off a cliff. Disappeared. Yeah. Disappeared, yeah. Um, and uh, really, there's been a lot of nuance has kind of crept in over time. And there's been, you know, interpretations of that study. So to kind of look at that study, it was a study that enrolled over 100,000 women um, aged between 50 and 79. But very few of them were under the age of 60. Um, and there was an observational arm, which meant that they followed up women over time. But there was a clinical trial arm as well, where women were randomized to either receive or not receive different interventions. And one of the interventions was hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and the question they were asking was not, does hormone replacement therapy improve menopausal symptoms or improve quality of life? It was, does hormone replacement therapy reduce the risk of cardiovascular events, such mm. as heart attacks and stroke? And actually, they excluded the kind of women where you would often be, that you would be meeting who have menopausal symptoms if a woman had menopausal symptoms she wasn't allowed to take part in that study so it doesn't really reflect the kind of people who are asking their doctors you know can i go on hrt um, uh, and as a result, it mainly enrolled women who were over the age of 60 and very few women enrolled in the study were the typical patients in their late 40s or age 50 to 60. And yes, it was uh, stopped at a certain point because there was shown that there was an increased risk of developing breast cancer. These are women who have never had breast cancer before, developing a new breast cancer in women who had HRT. But when you look at the figures, if you look at a thousand women going on to combined estrogen and progesterone HRT, HRT uh, with, uh, for five years, there might be an extra three cases per 1,000 women taking, fi taking five years of treatment. And that's for women aged between 50 uh, and 59. If you look at women whose uterus has been removed for whatever reason, uh, those women, as you know well, would be uh, put on estrogen alone. And there's actually a decreased risk of developing breast cancer with the estrogen. So, Conor, why is that? Like, is it this you know, that oestrogen has this protective effect and, you know, you tell me, why, why is that? Why is there a difference? 
Uh, we don't really understand it, actually. We don't really understand it. <laughs> it's so I was the, like, you know what? You answer okay, this. You answer this. I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you there's loads of theories out there, but we don't really understand it in detail. Um, we know the reason, uh, obviously, that women uh, would be put, the reason if your uterus is, is still intact, if your womb is still in place, uh, women are put on combined treatment with estrogen and progesterone because the estrogen on its own could stimulate a cancer of the womb. But if the womb has been removed, that's not a concern. So women would just go on on estrogen alone uh, treatment. And there was a reduced incidence of breast cancer. Um, the other thing I think that has emerged over time is that there was no evidence that hormone replacement therapy increased the risk of death, actually. And yeah. some evidence to suggest that for women between the age of 50 and 59, that there was a lower risk of death with five years of hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's a kind of a, an important thing to note. Uh, so there, yes, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer, but um, for women who have very severe menopausal symptoms, it's something to be discussed with them, but obviously it has to be taken into account with all of the other issues that are going on. And, and as, as you're familiar from some patients of mine that, that you've kindly seen, these, uh, I, I know the patients that I sent to you were having really horrendous severe symptoms really yeah. severe interfering with their quality of life on, on a major basis um there was a, a meta-analysis which is a an analysis of a load of different studies that came out subsequently uh, that suggested maybe a somewhat higher risk of breast cancer about one in 50 over 20 years and um, 150 extra women developing breast cancer because of combined hrt but there was a lot of weaknesses with that approach as well yeah and one of those was that they, they there was no randomized trial which is the gold standard for evidence yeah. of medicine, where you take a, a group of patients and you randomly assign them to one treatment or to, to no treatment. These were observational studies and they used uh, old fashioned HRT, if I might call it that, with much higher doses of hormone replacement therapy than would be considered uh, nowadays. So I would say that the, the kind of the maturing evidence from the Women's Health Initiative is probably uh, the most um, reliable information we have. And it has to be taken into context. So um, there's a guy um, uh, who I work with, a, a breast surgeon, Professor Martin O'Sullivan, who is uh, absolutely fantastic. And he has a beautiful slide that he gives when he talks about this topic, uh, where he looks at the uh, increased risk of breast cancer that is attributable to HRT. And then he puts that into the context of the increased risk of breast cancer that you can see with being overweight or obese. Yeah or having a high alcohol intake. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the, it's much higher with those things um, than it is with HRT. It's about perspective, isn't it? Yeah. It kind of gives you that yeah. perspective. I think there's a narrative sometimes that, well, there's no increased risk. And I don't think that's true. And certainly the evidence wouldn't suggest that. But but it's about having that discussion of where the benefit versus that risk yes. lies. Absolutely. Is it true to say, just from an oncology, like from your kind of science perspective, if you like, is it true to say, um, that in terms of HRT, we don't, it doesn't seem to be what they call an initiator. So it doesn't sort of make you make abnormal cells, but it can promote the growth of abnormal cells if they're there. Is that Absolutely, absolutely. True. Because, because uh, I, as I said, you know, most breast cancers are hormone responsive um, and women uh, very commonly when I tell them that they have a hormone responsive breast cancer, where, when we're having that first conversation, they often ask me, does, they say, does that mean I was making too much estrogen in my body? And I say, no, absolutely not. There's no evidence that women who develop hormone responsive, responsive breast cancers are making too much estrogen or indeed that getting estrogen in from outside is is the reason it's that the breast cancer cells are then have once they develop have uh, the tendency to grow in response to the estrogen so when estrogen is present uh, uh, when a hormone response to breast cancer develops it can then act as a factor to encourage growth and so if you have someone under 50 so say mm -hmm. I, if i have a perimenopausal woman so she's still having periods and I know that if she's still having periods, she is making her own estrogen. Otherwise, she wouldn't be having bleeding. Yeah. And if this perimenopausal woman goes on HRT for perimenopausal symptoms, am I changing her breast cancer? I'm asking you all the hard questions, Connell, but am I, am I changing her breast cancer risk, do you think, while she is still having her own endogenous, her own production of estrogen? Uh, it's it's likely to be a very minimal effect if it is there. It's likely to be a very minimal effect if it is there. I think, again, um, 
it all comes down to uh, data, you know, and there's an mm. absence of data in that particular group. You know, the Women's Health Initiative is the biggest uh, collection of data we have, but it's limited because they were mainly older women uh, where, yeah. where typically you wouldn't be like we know that the longer the duration of exposure to HRT, um, the, the, the higher the risk of breast cancer develops. So, you know, I think a long time ago, before all of this controversy about HRT back in the 90s, there was a tendency for women to go on HRT and stay on it for decades. Yeah. And so then you would see, you know, the risk increasing over a period of time. I think um, now there's probably more of a concentration on looking at uh, getting somebody through the um, perimenopausal period with a set kind of end date in sight for for, for ending the HRT. Obviously, perimenopause can you know it's it's a uh, it can be a very long uh, event itself. You know, there's no defined uh, time period for it. Uh, but um, I think somebody who's making their own endogenous estrogen, you're unlikely to be greatly increasing the load uh, uh, this, uh, that would be encouraging breast cancer. Yeah, I think the way I see it in my head, which maybe isn't factual or correct, but I suppose because we know that the dose of estrogen doesn't seem to impact or change the breast cancer risk. So I would often tell patients, you know, if you're on a 75 microgram patch versus a 25 microgram patch, this is for women who have no history of breast cancer yes. themselves, just for an average population. That doesn't seem to confer a different risk. And that's what seems to be important is how long you are exposed to these hormones. I suppose, you know, and, you know, in medical school, the way we're taught to take histories and you look at someone's length of their reproductive life when they started having periods and how late their own natural menopause was, that, that impacts breast cancer risk, doesn't it? The- it does. Absolutely. Yeah. So we talk about lifetime estrogen exposure and somebody mm. uh, who's had a very early menarche, so started having periods at a very, at, at a younger age, or um, somebody who kind of uh, went on um, have, with ovarian function uh, and uh, periods kind of later into her 50s uh, might be at a minimally increased risk. And obviously these things are very minimal. When I So when I take a history, just like you say there, when I take a history from somebody with breast cancer, I say, what age were you when started having periods and if, if she says 11 as opposed to yeah. 13 I, I'm not going to be able to say oh that explains it that's why you develop breast cancer you know it's that, nudging that, risk nudging, kind of one way. nudging yeah. absolutely yeah. you know and actually the you know the keeping a healthy weight exercising regularly would have a much bigger impact oh god I, every time I have this conversation I get the guilt over <laughs> The glass of wine last weekend and the fact that I haven't done any exercise in the last two months and you start to like, we're great at doling out good lifestyle yeah. advice for often. I'm sitting here at my massive cup of coffee and like, anyway. Um, but yeah, so I think it's it's important to kind of contextualize a lot of these risk factors. Yeah. Um, and, and HRT is in that bucket yeah. of risk factors and know that it is all a kind of individual discussion. And I'm not going to pin you down to the whole, you know, like if someone has breast cancer, should they or shouldn't they go on HRT? Because there is no right answer to that. Really. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what I want to say to you. You know, um, that Women's Health Initiative, you know, huge, huge initiative in the States to collect information, a massive trial. But at least it gives us very definable risks, even despite the imperfections that are there, the fact that it enrolled older women, that it excluded women who were, you know, had menopausal symptoms. But when it comes to women who've had breast cancer, we just don't have evidence out there. You know, I went trawling through the literature recently um, because, um, you know, it's a question that comes up much more frequently for me in clinic now. And uh, when you look at the studies, you know, people have not had the, you know, people have been afraid to can, kind of look at HRT in women who've had a hormone response to breast cancer. So one study I came across, had, it was what's called a cohort study, which is not a, a great study. It's not a randomized controlled trial. Um, again, it's just following two groups of women who may not be similar to each other. Um, but they looked at, at, at combining tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen treatment we use, with some HRT. And um, they didn't find uh, any detrimental effect with the combination of the HRT and tamoxifen. But we're talking about 342 women as opposed to uh, whatever in the Women's Health Initiative, 27,500 women randomized on the HRT. So if there was a small increased risk, you certainly wouldn't pick it up with 342 women. There is a randomized control trial that has has finished um, uh, 
gathering patients. Patients have signed on fresh, but it's 120 women. Uh, so it's 60 small. of those. Yeah, it's yeah. really small. So 60 of those will receive tamoxifen and 60 of those will receive tamoxifen plus HRT. Okay. And at that level, if there was a slight increased risk, you certainly wouldn't pick it up. They, they're more looking at to see, uh, is it tolerable for people to take this combination? How does it affect their menopausal symptoms that they're having? Uh, they okay. won't really be able to answer, uh, you know, is it completely safe to do this? Um, interestingly, even with women who have hormone negative cancers. I was just about to ask, <laughs> what about this third of women oh. or thereabouts? So how do we counsel them oh. in terms of their risk of recurrence? Because I, I know um, Joe Marsden, had, who's a, a retired breast cancer surgeon in, in the UK, and she has this lovely consensus statement for the British Menopause Society. And she talks about how, you know, a third, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a percentage of women who have a recurrence of breast cancer after having an initial hormone negative cancer, but their recurrence is hormone positive. Correct. Correct. Yeah. What so, do we count? What do we tell women? So it's really difficult because um, there's this uh, type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. So that means it's hormone negative and it's negative for another receptor called HER2. And it often affects younger women. And we give very intensive chemotherapy to treat it. Uh, so we often cause um, the ovaries to stop working actually prematurely. So we put them into an early menopause. And by the way, the menopause that we cause with chemotherapy is, is 10 times worse because yeah. instead of gradually fading out over a number of years, the the you fall off a cliff, really, fall off a cliff. Right? exactly yeah yeah uh, and then we tell them you can't take any hrt um and they say well hang on a second you told me that i had a hormone negative breast cancer what's the what's the issue here and uh it, it, the, the concern is that you know sometimes uh, when breast cancer occurs, it can change its spots. So an initially hormone negative breast cancer can reappear as hormone positive. And there's a concern that maybe if there are what we call breast cancer stem cells that are hiding out, these are the things we're trying to wipe out when we give the chemotherapy, uh, that if any of those uh, are present in the system, that they could be themselves hormone positive. We can say that the tumor that we've looked at under the microscope is hormone negative. But if there are little stem cells hidden away elsewhere um, from this yeah. cancer, that they could be hormone positive now i have to say that you know uh it's all quite theoretical and there's not a lot of evidence for it so again i think it has to come down sometimes to uh taking into account well what was the risk of this breast cancer recurring you know was this a very early breast cancer when we gave the chemotherapy did it disappear completely what we call the pathologic complete response and how severe are these symptoms that this person is having you know yeah, yeah. and weighing all of that up yeah yeah, yeah. I have a lot of women who would come in and they're quoting. There's a couple of books out there. There's one in particular, um, which would almost it almost kind of peddles this um, uh, narrative that, you know, taking estrogen, taking HRT doesn't cause any increased risk of a recurrence of breast cancer. And it's interesting because when you actually kind of delve through the details of this book and the, the who the author is sort of referring to, it's an he's talking about someone who's taking estrogen only. Now, again, I know that isn't associated with no increased risk, but yeah. I think it's hard for patients to maybe understand that when they're reading information like that, that the author of this piece or what you know, maybe you know, maybe referring to someone who's taking estrogen on its own as opposed to combination therapy, or maybe talk about a patient who had estrogen receptor negative, but minimal disease that was very responsive and it was 15 years ago, or and so on. It's just so heterogeneous it's so yeah. difficult I think for patients to know what applies to them and and it's so difficult to counsel people what do you if, if someone comes into you Conneth and and they say you know they've had uh, um estrogen receptor negative or positive breast cancer but they're very symptomatic do you have in your head do you have a sort of approach that you take with these patients um yeah I, I well i i think sometimes people are probably quite disappointed with me uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the consultation I, I would have to say um firstly i i tell them i say that there's a lack of lack of data out there um uh, and unfortunately it, it's unlikely that we will see large randomized trials kind of answering this question successfully. Um, I say, look, we know that estrogen is associated with a somewhat increased risk of developing breast cancer in the first place. And we know that your breast cancer is um, hormone responsive, your breast cancer that was removed. Um, uh, I sometimes talk about um, uh, an analogy that I would use would be um, that I would say that you're, or I don't know how helpful this is, but I say you're a tumor that was removed. We think of it as being like 
a forest fire, okay, um, uh, and that was removed. But where, when when I'm treating either with chemotherapy or with anti hormonal therapy, uh, we're trying to put out the embers that might be present yeah. from that fire. We can't see them, but we think that there might be embers present. So we're we're with the anti estrogen therapy that we use. We're we're pouring water uh, onto the onto the embers. Their worry would be that estrogen we might be pouring uh, accelerant onto the embers and yeah. encouraging them to grow. Um, but we don't know how high that risk is because it just hasn't been studied. There haven't been enough um, studies that have looked at randomly assigning women to, to, to give them estrogen in the setting of a previous hormone response of breast cancer. And all of our big international bodies that kind of uh, issue guidelines in oncology, in the oncology setting, like the American Society of Clinical Oncology or the European Society of Medical Oncology would say um, uh, any form of estrogen replacement is contraindicated absolutely contraindicated if you've had a hormone response of cancer such as breast cancer or yeah. cancer at the lining of the womb yeah. um, so uh, at the same time you've got somebody who's got really significant symptoms in front of you um, so we look at uh, I suppose the other remedies that we try to use and one that I'm particularly uh, supportive of is acupuncture actually for hot flushes oh. Uh, acupuncture uh, has been looked at in several studies uh, for hot flushes. Now, I know that's only one of the many, many uh, possible symptoms of, of menopause. Um, uh, but, uh, the, uh, you know, the, we have two options. Uh, often one is acupuncture and one is medicine. Um, different medicines that have been repurposed uh, because they have an anti-hot flush use. But there were some really interesting studies that compared the, the best medicines, such as uh, an antidepressant called venlafaxine or a, a, an anti-seizure drug called gabapentin. And they were compared to acupuncture and acupuncture was as effective or more effective in those studies. Stop. Mm. Really? Yeah, I'm actually That's giving a talk to, uh, to the uh, medical oncology SBRs uh, uh, registrars uh, in the next couple of days about this. So I've been reviewing some of those studies. Um, now, I mean, people say people who are critics of acupuncture say, oh, well, that's probably just a placebo effect with the acupuncture. Uh, but there were actually studies that looked at using uh, sham acupuncture, which is, is a kind of a way of a placebo uh, for acupuncture. As in if I walked in and started doing acupuncture, not knowing what I was actually yeah, yeah, doing. Yeah, exactly. But there's exactly. still an intervention happening. And there's so still an intervention. So there was one really interesting study that looked at this tablet called gabapentin or a placebo pill, which is just a sugar pill, or acupuncture or sham acupuncture. Acupuncture. And actually, there was an improvement in the frequency and the severity of the hot flushes in all of the groups. OK, so there is some placebo effect with acupuncture, yeah. but there's also a placebo effect with all medicines. We know this. True. Yeah. Uh, but the patients who were on the medicine, the gabapentin, had more side effects. And the l most sustained effect on hot flushes was in the patients who received the acupuncture. And there's well, I'm glad yeah. I spoke to you today. That's yeah. going to change my practice a little. I think I'm going to be a lot more vocal about that. That's brilliant. Absolutely. You know. And you know, yeah. when I when I talk to somebody and I say, well, you know, uh, I'm giving you this medicine that's causing severe menopausal uh, side effects, like the, my anti hormone therapy. And by the way, I'd like you to take another medicine now because of your hot flushes. And by the yeah. way, it's an antidepressant. You know, people just say, oh, uh, I really don't want to do that. But when you say, okay, well, would you consider acupuncture? They're you know they're kind of saying, okay, I, I you know it's it's not another chemical to take into my body you know have you ever so, had acupuncture i have had acupuncture yeah i've had acupuncture oh, yeah. and we have a fantastic physiotherapy physiotherapy department in, in my hospital and i uh, shared uh, with our physiotherapy colleagues i shared the studies that have been done in acupuncture in breast cancer survivors and they actually mimic the protocols when they're treating women for hot flushes they yeah. mimic the protocols that were used in those studies and oh. It's it's really interesting to see. It doesn't work for everybody. So some people will do two or three sessions and they'll come back to me and they'll say, no, I didn't notice any improvement. Yeah. Whatsoever. But other people will say, I'm having less frequent hot flushes and they're less intense when I get them. That's really interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I think because I'd be similar. Like I'm, you know, I would always explain to patients about estrogen or HRT really in any form being contraindicated. So it's, yes. it's something we want to avoid if you've had any type of breast cancer. And I really explained to them that, like, I think the best thing to do is exhaust your non-hormonal alternatives yes. first. But the problem with a lot of those medications, and they can be very effective and they can be really well tolerated, but there's definitely some patients who will get their hot flushes might improve a little, but it's, you know, superseded then by a really bad side effect. They can feel dizzy or they feel yeah. um, nauseated or whatever it might be. So it's a real balancing act, isn't it? It's really, Absolutely. it's really yeah. difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
This podcast is brought to you by our very own brand, Key For Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on keyforher.com. Please have 20% off on us by using the promo code KEYPODCAST in all capitals. Where do you think things are going, Conleth? Like if you, are there other medications maybe coming down the line, not so much from a menopause perspective, but from a breast cancer treatment perspective that may not be as difficult to take as things like tamoxifen? Uh, yes, there are, there are other medications that are being looked at. Um, uh, so there are these oral SIRDs. Um, uh, so uh, uh, tamoxifen belongs to a group of drugs that's called a, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And it has, uh, it, it, it encourages, it mimics estrogen in some places in the body and it, it acts against estrogen in other places in the body. But there's a different class of drugs in, in breast cancer called SIRDs, which is selective estrogen receptor down regulators or degraders and they are very effective and uh, sometimes can be better tolerated as well. Uh, one issue is that one that we currently have available uh, in use is an injection. It's actually two injections, one into each buttock once a month, uh, which uh, is not very pleasant. Um, so there, there has been work done for years trying to uh, get oral uh, tablet formulations of these certs, but they have come along now. So, so we have a trial running at the moment um, and nationally and internationally, which is looking at uh, using one of these oral SIRDs instead of the other medications that we use for breast cancer. So we're enrolling some women with high risk breast cancer and they're being randomized between the conventional treatments like tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors um, or, or this uh, oral agent. And there's another study that I read about recently, which specifically is, is looking at a, a medication to be used in combination with hormonal treatment to improve those hot flush symptoms. So it's a new right. class of drug that's been developed for the, um, for particularly for what we classically call hot flushes, but as you know, can present in many different ways. So for some people yeah. it's cold, for some people it's sweating. So we kind of call them vasomotor symptoms. And uh, yeah. this uh, this study is quite interesting looking at that uh, as another uh, medical medicine agent. You know, the ones that we use up to now, the me medicines that we use for hot flushes, they're all drugs that were developed for other illnesses that have been yeah. repurposed because they happen to have a, this effect on hot flushes. So one is a, a blood pressure tablet, but it causes dizziness and lightheadedness if it drops and, the blood pressure. And it's pressure. not very effective. And it's not very effective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the other problem. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And then and then there's the antidepressant, the anti-seizure drugs and so on. Um, I, there is a study that has recently uh, completed accrual in Ireland, uh, which is the menopause after cancer study. Uh, it's yeah. run through the matter in Vincent's. Um, and uh, they are looking they were using a combination condom or they, they, were, they were using they, yeah they were using um some of the medicines they were using i think venlafaxine was there i think gabapentin was yeah. there there was a drug called citalopram as well um, and they were using cognitive behavioral therapy as well yeah. uh, as a mechanism to try and uh, help uh, manage the hot flushes um uh, all kind of non estrogen based approaches so they have enrolled uh, all the patients um but they haven't uh, released their findings yet i suppose they're still working through the data and it'll be interesting to see their findings from that Study. And I suppose from our end, I know in the UK, there's the new, now it's getting a bit sciencey, but there's a, they're called neurokinin receptor antagonists. So they're these new medications that are excellent for vasomotor symptoms, but don't have an estrogen in them. And hopefully like they seem to be a lot more effective than those other medications that you're referring to that have some impact on hot flushes and night sweats. But it, I think it's very challenging for a lot of women. Their, their issues are not just confined yeah. to hot flushes and they're the, they're the, women that are really that are challenging the joint aches and pains and the general fatigue and separating out what is maybe something that has happened in post cancer treatment yeah absolutely. and what is more a hormonal issue and so and knowing what will improve what can be really difficult um and then vaginal symptoms are very common or what we call genital urinary symptoms so vaginal dryness and painful sex and bladder symptoms i would often prescribe now we'd obviously talk to women about vaginal moisturizers and other things yes. they can do first over the counter but localized estrogen is generally considered to be pretty safe, even in a setting of someone. I mean, you use it with caution and with counseling, but even in the setting of someone who's had a history of breast cancer. 
Absolutely. And and more so as time has gone on, I think people mm. uh, in our community, in the medical oncology community, have got much more comfortable with us as time has gone on. There was always a concern that local application of, of estrogen to the vagina, that some of it would be absorbed into the uh, system, into the circulation. And, you know, there is evidence that a very tiny amount is absorbed into the circulation. But um, really, there has, you know, several studies have shown no increased risk of breast cancer recurrence with that approach. Uh, And um, particularly, I think, you know, for for somebody who's on tamoxifen, to me, it's a it's a no brainer because it's a a premenopausal woman who's making lots of estrogen in her ovaries. We put her on tamoxifen to block the action of of estrogen. So if she is uh, then absorbing a very tiny portion of estrogen through uh, her vagina, through the vaginal application, you know, uh, you would expect tamoxifen to do the same job. Or indeed, okay. a postmenopausal woman who's taken tamoxifen, you'd expect it to do the same job. But even with the aromatase inhibitors, these other tablets that work in a slightly different way, you know, I think uh, in order to allow somebody to be able to continue on with their um, with their treatment, because with, particularly with those aromatase inhibitors, the vaginal dryness can be really bad. Yeah. Um, and and uh, actually recurrent urinary tract infections as a result, you see a, quite a lot of that. You know, you see somebody, they come in, they say, I've been on four or five antibiotics this year, you know. And we don't want somebody taking loads of antibiotics, you know, because there's a whole other there's a whole other problem there. <laughs> damned yeah. if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I don't have any issues with that. And as you say, you know, um, uh, obviously you would say you know, you could take it for a period of time. And if, if your symptoms completely resolved, maybe then take a break from it. But if you to kind of go back, if they recur again, you know, uh, that if you're, if you've taken the low dose vaginal estrogen uh, for maybe six or eight weeks and your symptoms are fully resolved, then look at taking a break from it and then kind of go back to it again in the future. And maybe using some of the over over the counter, because they yeah. are quite good. We've yeah. really good vaginal moisturizers that yes. people aren't aware of because most people know lubricants exist, but they're yes. for intercourse. Yes. There's moisturizers, like moisturizing your face, you know, twice a week. They can be yes. helpful. Yeah. Um, and the other hormone that comes up a lot, and I promise I'll stop asking you difficult sciencey questions in a sec, but um, but just in terms of testosterone, because we like we get asked about testosterone so much in the clinic it's become a real kind of buzzword and um a lot of women are really keen to try it i'm not totally convinced about to be honest how effective it is or how useful it is for women to feel better we know it can be helpful for low libido we don't have great evidence for using it for anything else to be perfectly honest at this point um but in women with a history of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer what impact might testosterone have on their risk if any. Oh, oh my God, that is, uh, I was so afraid you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's but really like it's, interesting. You know, it's really data, interesting. right? We have no like, data. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, uh, you know, uh, um, the last time that I looked at this, I could not find anything one way or another, because I get asked this question all the time. And the endocrinologists often write to me about this as well, you know. Um, uh, so what I promise to do is to go, is to go off now after this, and I'm going to do another <laughs> all through the literature and if i find something I'll, I'll give it to you for the show notes if i can find any any uh yeah that, that'd be that'd be great it is yeah. it's difficult isn't it it's difficult to know and especially yeah i think we're just going blind with a lot of this stuff because yeah, absolutely. even uh, like giving testosterone to to perimenopausal women where we've no information breast cancer or not and yeah. giving testosterone to women in general is a pretty recent phenomenon so we're really lacking on data to be fair but well you know um, Quiver, it's so interesting because i was at um, a gp uh, study evening uh, run by my hospital the other evening and uh, owen o'sullivan one of the endocrinologists gave an amazing talk it was a men's health yeah, evening. OK, but he gave a really interesting talk about testosterone in men, you know, yeah. um, and testosterone replacement. And uh, interesting, you know, interesting to see so many conditions that will cause low testosterone in men, including being overweight, obstructive sleep apnea, huh. uh, all associated with low testosterone. Um, uh, and uh, but I do think because there's there's going to be a lot more uh, focus on that as a as a form of HRT for men in the coming years, you know, although he was very clear to point out that the andropause, as we call it, is not the same yeah. as the menopause. Um, yeah. uh, in men, testosterone falls over a very gradual incline naturally over the period of, of life. There isn't this kind of rapid decline at the age of 50 that there is for women. So it is a it is a different uh, uh, it is a different situation. But women in women, too, that's how we see testosterone behave in women. Yeah. So regardless of when you actually have like if you've early menopause or regardless of when your last period is, your testosterone will decline just gradually throughout that's your life. So till you get to your 
mid to late 60s. And then there was a recent Australian study that showed your testosterone levels in women climb in your 60s. Why? I have no idea. Yeah. Whereas you're right with estrogen and progesterone, it is a kind of, I mean, not quite off a cliff, but you're right. It's much more yeah. abrupt. Yeah. yeah. So in, in terms of just ending on a kind of positive note, if you like, you know, what what are the what, what are we doing right in this country in terms of, of breast cancer care? And like, what are the changes that have happened in the last few years that are really positive, do you think? Uh, you know, sometimes when we're looking at uh, at individual treatments for breast cancer, we see relatively small gains. You know, uh, we might see for a chemotherapy treatment, we might see a 5% gain uh, in, in kind of cure rate uh, with the addition of a new chemotherapy. And, you, and when you talk to patients about that, they say that's a very small number. But when you look at breast cancer in general, the survival of breast cancer over the decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, there has been a steady improvement in survival. So most women with breast cancer uh, are cured. That's uh, something that I think sometimes because there's wonderful awareness about breast cancer, but it's such a scary word. Breast cancer is such yeah. a scary uh, term. So uh, it's something that I always say to people when they come to see me in clinic, women when they come to see me in clinic with early breast cancer, most women are cured. Um, uh, and when we talk about very early stage breast cancer, we're talking about high 90% of women uh, being cured. Um, okay. We've got a bit better in terms of our treatments. Uh, we're giving less chemotherapy to women with breast cancer now than we were 10, 15 years ago. We have tools to help us identify who are the minority of women with hormone responsive breast cancer who, who actually benefit from chemotherapy and who are the majority who don't. Uh, and um, our treatments in general have got better. And I think there's greater awareness of survivorship issues as well. You know, there's lots of research now being sponsored by the Irish Cancer Society um, looking at um, uh, survivors and how to make people survive uh, with better quality of life after a breast cancer diagnosis or, or, or other other cancers. We in our hospital have a study that's open, um, sponsored by Breakthrough Cancer Research, which is looking at lymphedema, which is a, a, the swelling of the arm that you can get after breast cancer surgery. But you can also get it after treatment for other cancers like cervical cancer or prostate cancer, for example. Uh, and uh, that would be affecting the lower limbs. But we're looking at uh, identifying the risk of lymphedema before somebody has any treatment, doing baseline measurements of their limbs uh, using these machines like the weighing scales that you have in a pharmacy that use bioimpedance and then following them up over time. So, so hopefully we won't be diagnosing lymphedema when somebody comes in and says, my arm is really swollen and my hand is swollen, but we'll be picking it up by based on a little change on electrical current on the scale. And we'll be saying, okay, there's something we can do to prevent this from developing into full-blown lymphedema. And that's just oh, one that's study really out of many that are being done. Yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. I think I, that's very positive, isn't it? Like that's really optimistic. Yeah. yeah. I think for a long time in oncology, the focus was treatment, treatment, treatment. How do we make yeah. treatment better? And more and more, when I go to our big meeting in Chicago every year now, more and more of the posters that are on display are about um, uh, kind of reducing the side effects of treatment or improving quality of life afterwards. Great. Okay. Well, that's a great positive note to end things on. Thank you so much again. It was brilliant having you on and you're just, like I said, a wealth of information. So it's great to get a little bit of time to just pick your brains and ask you lots of questions. So thank you so much. It was brilliant. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Key For Her podcast. We'd be so grateful if you could hit subscribe, rate and share this podcast with your friends. For tips, tricks and hacks and all things perimenopause, menopause, periods, menstrual cycles and skin health, follow us at Key For Her on TikTok and Instagram. Check out our website keyforher.com for more information.